guys could throw my slide up. God is worthy. Did you give him praise this morning? We'll take a second to get into it. God is so good. So good. As many of you know, this is Pentecost Sunday, celebrating what happened in the church 2,000 years ago. And part of what we did today was to celebrate where we are, the testimonies we had given, the I will rise, which we've seen multiple times, but it was imperative that we've seen it again today. Psalm 134 from Shay and Psalm 122 from Miss O. We had testimony from Becca, Pastor Joe, Tinietta. God wants to show us something. You see, Pentecost, I believe, is less about displaying our spiritual gifts, and it is more about moving from a lower state to a higher state. There's a difference between Pentecostal and Pentecostalism in the church. Much of what we know in the common church is Pentecostalism. You know, shake it till you make it. Or in other words, for a lot of folks, it's faking it till they're making it. Amen. And let me tell you something about being Pentecostal is if you are blessed and filled with the Spirit of God and working in the Spirit of God, then one thing that we have is that the blessing of water flows from us. Cursing can't flow from the same river as blessing does. Oftentimes we evaluate how somebody is baptized in the Spirit of God or whether or not somebody's filled with the Spirit of God based on whether or not they have spoken in tongues or not. But yet that same person that flips their hair and busts out a bobby weave in the church service, amen. I don't know if you get bobby weaves. I'm going to say bobby pins. There's no bobby weaves. I don't weave, y'all. I part. But yet that same person does nothing but tear down leaders in the church. That same person does nothing but gossip. That same person is filled with nothing but stories of hate for the church. Why somebody else who we say hasn't shown the same spiritual gifts is over there being a blessing of God, carrying the spiritual fruits of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so there's got to be something that's got to be said about what we do and how we are when we are Pentecostal or our Pentecostalism and how it functions. I would tell you much of what happens today in our Pentecostal churches is not from the Holy Spirit, but is from the imitator of light himself. Don't you for one minute think that there's not a demonic tongue that imitates the tongue that our spiritual God gives us, our spiritual Father gives us to pray in. The fact that we can pray in a language of angels Recall that Lucifer was an angel himself. So don't think he doesn't know how to imitate. Uh, we know how to imitate it, right? We get at youth camp and we're all going and everybody starts teasing around and all of a sudden they want to joke about having the Holy Ghost and everybody's spelling Coke backwards and they're running laps, you know. <laughs> Did you do that, Zion, last year? Don't you? Just spell Coke backwards real fast in your head and you'll get it. Maybe some of y'all get it later in the car. Some of y'all trying to figure out how to spell it backwards. It's going to be a process for you. But let's move along. I felt like God was calling us to a place of ascent. And the place of ascent is an upward moving. It's a rising. It's a, it's a, move, a movement that is going forward and upward. And sometimes that's hard for us to see in the local church and in the church worldwide. It seems as if the church isn't moving forward, but that the, the enemy's agenda is moving forward. Amen. You know, I remember when I was a kid, my grandma Joyce would tell me, she said, one day, Mikey, she said, you know, nah, y'all ain't allowed to call me that. She said, one day, Mikey, she said, you're not going to be able to allow your children to watch regular TV. Uh, she said there are going to be nude people on there and they're going to be cussing and they're going to be talking things that, that you won't want your children to see, that they won't be. It'll be what is supposed to be on rated R films and it'll be on your local broadcast system. And I said, like, my grandma, I was like, grandma, you just, you know, you're crazy, grandma. You're crazy. But lo and behold, grandma was right. You can't just let your kids watch any old thing on TV because you don't know what's going to pop up on there or what's not going to be on a woman or a man on. Amen. 
What's not going to be on them when they show up in the advertisement? We was watching TV the other day and a Victoria's Secret ad come on and Colton covered my eyes. <laughs> I asked him when it was over. I said, did you watch? He said, I had to, Dad, to know when it was over. <laughs> I didn't know whether to rebuke him or raise him up in that moment. At least he was looking out for dear old dad, you know. He was trying to keep me from stumbling. But the world in which we live in, the church which we live in, we've got to understand that God is calling us to continuously be climbing, continuously be walking, and continuously be moving towards what he's doing. And the Psalms 120 through 134 We find a collection of psalms that is written, and they're called a song of ascents. Or the whole collection would be called the songs of ascents. And these songs were sang by people who were climbing up Mount Zion to go to the temple to worship. Because Jerusalem, after all, was sat at a high elevation. It was 2,474 feet above sea level. And so if you wanted to go to the temple and worship, you had to get your butt in gear and get to going. It wasn't like just walking into church, amen. Well, we're praying that God gives us a ground level building the next, you know, the next building that we get. And we can just drive right up and walk right in. They had to climb up to the temple to worship. It was an ascent. It was a movement upward. I decided that I'm going to read the full chapter for us real quick. Don't, don't get, don't get worried. It's six verses. It said, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. Then we sat among the nations. The Lord, then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Then they said, the Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. It goes on. In verse 4 through 6, and we'll preach from this next week. It says, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes, he who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Lord, would you bless this word today, God, that you would help us to understand what you want to speak to us. The direction you wish to take us this morning, God, and what you would have for our hearts to hear. God, we praise you and we worship you in Jesus mighty name so I chose to focus on one through three for this Sunday and the last three four through six I believe will speak to us so much on evangelism next week but God really wanted to talk to us this Pentecost Sunday about some things there were several popular texts that I could preach from to you today. Joel 2 and 28 could have been my topic. Um, uh, Matthew 3 and 11, John, 21 and, and, uh, John 20 and 21, Acts 1, 2, 4 and more could have been our, our topic of conversation for Pentecost Sunday. However, I felt that God was pulling us away from the most popular text to put a new word in our heart. Or rather, maybe God was calling us away to put a new song in our hearts. Maybe it was that God wanted us to sing something a little different this Pentecost Sunday. In a day and age that we're living in, all the popular songs, you've heard them. If you flip on the radio, uh, all the popular songs that are out there today, they speak of a time of promiscuity. They speak of a time of, of, of guys getting together and talking about how many women that they can sleep with and, and how big of a man that makes them. But I would wish that they would begin to rap about something a little different. It isn't about how many women you've been with. It's about the fact that you can be with the same woman for a dozens of years and continue to woo or wow that same woman. That's what being a man is. In a day and age when our rap songs and and even our country songs and and some of our other songs are moving into talking about drugs, sex, and the rock and roll, and they're glorifying selling dope, and they're glorifying using dope, and we're rapping about trap houses, and our kids are coming in rapping about things they have no idea what they're saying. You hear them catching the lyrics and, and spewing them along. I believe that it's time for the church to get a new song. I believe it's time for the church to begin to sing something that beckons from within my soul and begins to minister to my very heart, to the nations, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Because when we go along singing a tune that is different than the world, they're going to take notice. I tell you this morning that singing is like the gateway drug to the church. 
gateway drugs open up other opportunities in the drug world. And we don't want you using gateway drugs. We want you using gateway singing. Amen? Somebody give the Lord a praise. <laughs> but God gave us the fivefold ministry in the Bible in Ephesians 4. He gave us the fivefold ministry. And so we have apostles, we have prophets, we have teachers, we have evangelists, and we have pastors in there. And the prophets come forth and they come in our church. We work prophetically and worship. And we begin to open up the gate that the word of God can be sung in the house and the word of God can be preached within the house. And so singing begins to open up for us different avenues in which the church ought to operate. Such things as healing, power, and prophecy. I tell you that healing and power are exactly what the early disciples needed. Because they were singing to a different tune, weren't they? It didn't sound like the song they were once singing. Because Jesus Christ here was with them, and he walked with them for three, three and a half years. And here's Christ walking with the disciples. And all of the sudden, the disciples' life is flipped upside down. Jesus Christ looks like he's been defeated by the cross, swallowed up by the grave, and all of his promises have went with him. And here are the disciples, and they're not singing that high and mighty song behind the Savior when he's moved with compassion to heal the masses. When the lame walk and the deaf hear and the mute speak and the blind can see. I'm sure their song was much different then, wasn't it? You know what it's like when service is breaking out and there's a killer. There's a fire tunnel going on up at the altar service. You're right there dancing around, amen, just like you, like you brought that on yourself. But you know, the minute something happens, your account overdraft. The minute somebody starts bashing you on Facebook, the minute somebody deletes you from Facebook, the minute that something, why is social media run so many of our lives and not the word of God? I'm fearful that maybe the church today is so overran by social media and not the word of God, and that may be where part of the problem lies. But our life begins to be in disarray is the moment we don't see a fire tunnel, the moment we're not speaking in tongues or prophesying, the moment... Nobody is amening us. The moment nobody signs up to help in children's ministry, the moment people promise us that they'll be here to help clean and they don't show up and you're here at midnight, like some of our lovely cleaning crew has been so many times by themselves. The moment that you're told that this would happen in ministry, the moment you're told that this would happen and it doesn't happen and you're no longer high on the hog, that's where the disciples were. And as I begin to swallow this up and I begin to think about what what God was doing, that's when God began to remind me it's not so much about the show, but it's about the ascent. You see, think about it. The disciples couldn't just show up in the upper room and start bow-dying and hondying. There was a process for them to get there. There was a journey or an ascent in which they had to go to get to where they were. Several elements stood in between where they were and where they needed to be and the power and the spirit of God. And the ascent, church, hear me today. I didn't just show up and start pastoring. It was a journey. I started serving in 2009 as a director of missions. Then this happened and that happened. And there was a journey before 2009. You better believe that. There was a point in my life when people would say, you know, one of the highest achievements I had when I was 16 years old was that people would say, hey, man, you're so wild, there's no way you'll live to see 18. I thought that was bragging rights. I made it to see 18 and I wooed the crowds. They thought it was some sort of major achievement in my life. Even my friend's parents were like, dude, you ain't going to live to see 21. There's no way that you'll live past 21. You're going to die somehow, some way. It's going to be through these drugs. It's going to be through driving. It's going to be through those women. Something is going to kill you along the way. Hey, man, I silenced all the critters. uh, Critters. The critters, they they got silenced too. Critics. It was a process. I didn't show up speaking in tongues, amen. I had to drag myself to that altar many times. There was a low valley in which I was in before God ever got to move in my life. And so we get to this place in the church, though, where something bad happens and we just we feel like all of a sudden, whoa, we are defeated and we can't get there. But God wants to remind us that the bad things prepare us for the ascent that will take us to the good things. 
Here are the disciples. They're there on Mount Olivet. Can you pull up that next slide for me? When Jesus ascends into heaven, he's walked with them for 40 days. Remember, 40 days ago, he had went to the grave and been swallowed up. All their dreams were, their dreams were crushed and, and torn apart. Now Jesus is back and all is well, but now he takes me to the Mount of Olivet. And now he's talking some junk like he's going to leave me again. Then he's going to try some hogwash on me like it's good for me to go. Because if I don't go, the comforter, can't, the comforter can't come to be with you. I don't want the comforter. Bro, you've been out here healing folks. They lowered a dude in through the roof. You picked this mat up and said, get on. Who's the comforter? For real. His name don't even sound cool. So here's where the disciples are on the Mount of Olivet. And Jesus says, go to Jerusalem and wait for my power that you shall receive on high. Well, all is good and well if they can just walk across the plain and get there. But they can't walk across the plain and get there. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that it's a, a day, a Sabbath day journey away in which they have to go. That seems like a long walk. I ain't about that. I took the boys on a walk yesterday. We made it one block. We went home. <laughs> We was done. Cole's like, can we do it again? I'm like, maybe next week, man. <laughs> the other obstacle that these guys have in front of them is the fact that they're over here on the Mount of Olives or the Mount Olivet, however you want to call it. They're over here at an elevation at roughly 2,700 feet at its highest point, And Jesus is talking some stuff like go over there. And if it was a downhill journey, it'd be good. But the Kidron Valley stood in their way. There was something that stopped them from being able to progress straight to what they wanted. Let me tell you something. If there's nothing standing in front of your promise, it's not your promise. If there's no barriers, go get something else. That's a setup from the devil. Come on. I know many preachers who are no longer in pulpits. I know many people who are in the ministry for whatever, whether it's evangelism or children's ministry or, 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 or people who work in the office or whatever the case may be in the church that they thought that what they was doing was good and there was no resistance. And now they're far, far out the church because the devil likes to play setups. He likes to appear that there's a blessing in front of me when really it's just a mess. It's just a trap. This is how you know it's God. He'll mess around and put the Kidron Valley right in front of you and say, go get your promise, baby. Your promise is over there. Amen. Come on. And some of y'all want to get inside the valley and you want to say, woe is me. I've been walking in this valley. And you start singing from Psalms in 23. Even though I walk through the valley, you try to act like you testify. You ain't testifying nothing. You trying to throw a pity party under God. God, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God, I'm doing this for you. God, I shall fear. I won't fear it, Lord. I fear no evil. You know, you just got done checking the surveillance footage and everything. Make sure what was around the corner. <laughs> when really what we need to be saying is I'm not staying in the valley. I'm just changing mountaintops. I'm just getting to my promise. It's over there. I ain't got time to be here. Amen. I'm coming up out of the valley, somebody. I'm coming up out of the valley. My finances, that's temporary. I'm coming up out of this valley. Relational issues, that's temporary. I'm coming up out of this valley. Children's behavioral issues, temporary. I'm coming up out this valley, somebody. Come on, depression, temporary. I'm coming up out of this valley, somebody. You need to start speaking the thing over your life. Drug addiction, alcoholism, porn addiction, whatever the case may be, we've got to start prophesying over the church. I'm coming up out this valley. Oh, y'all ain't feeling it like I'm feeling it. Somebody needs to tell your neighbor, I'm coming out of my valley. So often we walk into the church and we expect to be in that zone. But just like the disciples, there's something that stands between us and the place in which we want to be. If y'all are honest this morning, some of y'all going to admit there were some obstacles just getting to church. So some of y'all might, some of y'all about came with a homicide on your hands, getting ready to do your child's funeral. <laughs> First lady. <laughs> 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 
Bryson's got a testimony to share later. <laughs> For some of you, it might have been your spouses. For some of you, it might have been traffic. For some of you, last week, it was the police because you was driving too fast. Amen. For some of you, it was that gas. For some of you, it was gas. For some of you, it was that demon hiding under your pillow that said, tuck back in. Mm. If we're honest, just getting to church some days would seem as a challenge. And it would seem that all hell is out against me some mornings. Everything fights me to get where I need to be. I was with the brother last night, and he's like, I'm not going to be able to be there, Pastor. I got some, some crazy circumstances going on in my life. And, and I can't share what it is right now. They'll, they'll make it public in a few days. And he's like, I want to be there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know that things have been going. I haven't been there like I should be, yada, yada. Tomorrow's going to be another day. Because of the, I'm like, what in the world, man? I'm like, brother, I don't know what hell's assignment is on you, but hell don't want you in the church house. God wants to do something in and through you, but the devil knows it, and he wants to keep you out with everything that he has. You think you can just skip one Sunday because you're going to go do this, and you're going to go to the park, you're going to take the kids to Kings Island or whatever it is? I promise this. You skip one Sunday going to Kings Island, the next Sunday you're going to talk yourself into sleeping in, amen? The next Sunday after that, you're going to talk yourself into picking up extra shift. Come on, the next Sunday after that, you're going to talk yourself in to getting food ready for the picnic because you almost stay up on Saturday night preparing the food for your picnic to celebrate after church. Can I tell you I was up till 12 30 praying to God to give me the word today and I was back up at 4 a.m. Come on. God don't want to hear about why you can't come. God wants to hear about why you will come. And I'm not telling you that to get a pat on my back but I don't take giving this word lightly. I come in and I, I prepare and I, I, I churn before the Lord and I stir before God. And I started on this thing on Monday and I was excited. And I started sending back a text. I think we need to do this and we need to do that. And it's Saturday night and I'm wrestling with it. And I'm like, Lord, I thought I had the download. He said, no, brother, you needed the ascent. You needed the ascent. And I said, I needed some sleep, Blair. I needed to go to sleep. I got about three and a half hours. I may be showing, I don't know. There are situations, there are mountains that begin to come in front of us. You hit that next slide for me. The Bible says this in Romans 8 and 35. It said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? The truth is, is no matter what we go through in life, there's going to be situations that show up. The truth is, is that you're going to face valleys. Some of you ain't even going to get out the church parking lot and a big old valley going to show up right in front of you. Amen. The question, what are you going to do with it? Go through it. Go down into the pit of that valley. Get your blessing and come up out of there. Amen. That's what I'm doing when valleys show up in my life. I challenge you to do the same thing. There's going to be things that show up, and they're going to be devastating. They're going to be mind-boggling. They're going to rock us to our very core. They're going to make us want to cuss and kick and quit and make us go on pouting and take away our shouting. But we can't allow that to happen because no matter what happens, these things that show up, whether it's tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword, that's a situation. And I've been blood-bought, born again by the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, and he is stronger than in his situation. I need to remind the church this morning that he defeated the cross, conquered the grave, and sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost that I shall not be a victim, but that I shall walk as a victor. Somebody give God praise in the house. The problem happens to us so often times is that these valleys show up and we lose our praise. These valleys show up and we put our praise down. Why is it that we put the joy of the Lord down for some temporary bogus, and as the Apostle Paul put it, dung? You know, the blessing of God stares us in our face. An enemy over here talking some stuff, and we stop looking at God, and we start looking at what he's saying. He starts saying things to you like, hey, you're never going to come up out that building. Hey, this is always going to be this, and you're always going to max out and then fall back down. This is the case, and that's the case. I just got to reminding him the other day, look at the building we tore down, Satan, amen. Come on, we're broadening our borders. We're expanding our horizon. You don't know what we're about to build or what God's about to do. Look at our parking lot. Look at our people. Look at what God is preparing for us. 
But the problem is so many of us leave our praise and we forget where we left it. I'll tell you this. God has sent me here with one simple assignment today. And that's to help you get your praise back. To help you get your praise back. Because I know where you left it. I know where it's sitting at. And you know if you're going to be honest with yourself this morning, you know where your praise is at too. It's at that last pile of dung that you went past. Amen. It's about time to go back to the dung, get your praise, and come up out of the valley, church. The more I thought about it, this scripture, it applied to us in such a powerful way as a church. Maybe you're not a member of RHC, and it's probably going to apply to you as well if you would allow it. It starts off in the scripture. I think I have another slide on there, do I? All right. It starts off in this scripture, and it says, we were like those who dream. We were like those who dream. Think about it. Many of us in this church have suffered heartache. We've suffered individual problems. We've seen growth and we've seen decline. We've seen growth and then we've seen change in ministry. And then we've seen this and then we've seen that. And then we've seen in our personal life, maybe some of our babies getting locked up. I've been praying for the same family member for years and they still ain't in the church house. Come on. But I ain't giving up. They're coming. Amen. And so these different things begin to tarry in our life, and they begin to tear us down. And this is exactly what the Lord God is speaking to the people of Zion, or the people of Jerusalem, or the people of RHC. And he's beginning to say, you will be like those who dream. In other words, what God is doing when he restores us, and how he's restored us, has been completely unbelievable. That's the power that we are walking in. Also, he begins to go on. He says, we were like those who were filled with laughter and our tongues with a shout of joy. Amen. Hey, I bet if you surveyed 100 people about how church was supposed to look this morning, you would get 100 different responses. Oh, well, if Susie Sue don't run speaking in tongues, we ain't have church. If Dave ain't fall out, we didn't have church. If somebody didn't lose their shoes, we ain't have church. If somebody didn't shout, we ain't had church. And man, if the pastor don't wear a suit, we ain't have church. Guess you ain't having church today. Come on, somebody. If the worship team ain't singing this song, we ain't having church. If they didn't do this, we, you know, it's only church if it meets all of our requirements. Can I tell you something that is problematic in the church today, though? Much of what we even do as church or Pentecostalism, we'd have to teach Jesus to do anyway. He walk up in here like, what in the world? Somebody heal somebody. Somebody cast the devil out, and let's get our praise on in this house. But in other words, they said that they were filled with laughter. In other words, they were people who told their faces they were saved. Some of y'all going to get that at McDonald's later. He said, our tongues was filled with shouts of joy. Come on. So oftentimes, our tongues are filled with something else. Hey, listen, and I've preached from this pulpit many times. Be real. If you're having a bad day, don't fake it. Don't lie to me. I know when you're lying. I know if you're having a bad day. But so oftentimes, it's not even about folks having a bad day, is it? You just know. You know there's that person there walking in. You're just like, oh, snap, I'm walking over here. I don't want to hear that. Don't want to hear it. He's going to be like, what happened? how was your day? Well, I'm going to tell you what. I got in the shower this morning. It was too hot. I can't stand it. My water heater's set too high. Well, God bless. I can't help it either. Those little kids over in Haiti and Guatemala ain't never had hot water. But I'm sorry that you burnt yourself on your water this morning. Praise the Lord Jesus. I made my oatmeal, and it was too hot, so I put it in the freezer. When I got it up out the freezer, it was too cold. I had to put it back in the microwave. Oh, woe is me and my soul, somebody. Come on. You better be lucky you had a bowl of oatmeal this morning. Not only over in Haiti and Guatemala, but I'll tell you, there's starving babies in America. Right now, there are babies who, who you are happy that summer's coming. There are children in America right now who are worried about summer because they know that their only meal is coming from that school-made lunch. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. The Bible says that, that when our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was filled with joy, that's how we knew God had done a thing, amen? That's when we had church. That's when God had moved. Not with complaining and naysaying, but with the power of God. Have you ever just seen somebody just break out in a spirit of laughter in the church? Oh, man, it is powerful. It is all. All they can do is laugh. All they can do is shout of joy at what God has done for them. The great things and great ways that God has brought them through. 
the scripture goes on and it says, the Lord has done great things for them. That's what the nations are saying. Church, can I tell you right now that the nations, that there are churches, not just in our city, but in our state, in our country that are talking about what we're doing here. So oftentimes we get focused on what's not happening. We forget to focus on what is happening. I met with the pastor earlier this week. Pastor, one of the biggest churches in our city. And he said to me, we like what you're doing. We've been watching you. And he said these exact words from his mouth. He said, there's no other churches in this city doing what you're doing. If I had a mic, I would have dropped it. Because I started to think about all the things we weren't doing. And then he reminded me, he began to prophesy to my soul, amen. And he began to tell me about all the stuff that this city knows is happening at Risen Hope Church, amen. You let another pastor take you out to eat and begin to prophesy about what's going on. We got churches in other states talking, sending messages. Hey, pastor, I see that. Hey, pastor, I see that. Hey, pastor, I done heard about this. Hey, brother, y'all got it going on. Hey, man, keep up the good fight. Keep it up. Keep it up. We are being spoken about among the nations, church. That's what having church looks like. Amen. Amen. Not just running around speaking in tongues, but the effect that we are sending out past our borders on Sunday morning because we are not just a church that is housed in this building, but we are hashtag more than four walls. That's for your Twitter feed. But we get so stuck on where we are and what we don't have. We get so stuck in this mess and in this rut and we want to look at things and we want to mourn. But I believe that God is calling us back. In this scripture, the word says the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. That's something that he did back then. Amen. Come on, I don't know if you know, but God restored this house. A couple of years ago, it was on the verge of shutting down. God has restored this house. I wish somebody would just give God praise for a minute. Pastor Mike just got to show up in all the videos smiling like, I'm here. (laughs) We were like those who dream. Every single time that it happened, I couldn't believe what was going down. I had to wake my wife up in the middle of the night. She said, you're going to have to stop waking me up at night. Quit coming in the room when I'm asleep. I'm like, baby, but can you believe what God has done? I'm like in a dream over here. And she's like, baby, I am in a dream. I was literally sleeping. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue shouts of joy. Then among the nations, what I just told you, they begin to say the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Amen. Sean, if you can come to the piano this morning. I just want you to do me a favor. The next time you get low and woe is me and you start thinking about how God hasn't blessed you and how you don't know what to do, I want you to turn your Bible over to Psalm 1 and 20. And I want you to know that God is your peace in the midst of hostility. Amen. I flipped my Bible over to Psalm 121 and I read a little scripture and it said I can look upon the hills and know that my help, it comes from the Lord. Amen. In Psalm 1 and 22, a new song was deposited inside of me and I sang. I was glad glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. In Psalm 1 and 23, he is my mercy giver. In Psalm 1 and 24, he is my thanksgiving. And somebody needs to know this today. He is your deliverance. Somebody. In Psalm 1 and 25, he became my benediction for those who would do wrong against me. In Psalm 1 and 26, he is my restoration and my salvation and becomes my shout of joy. Somebody. In Psalm 1 and 27, he is my wisdom builder and becomes my watchman. In Psalm 1 and 28, I read that he is the supplier of my every blessing. In Psalm 129 I find out that he is my righteousness. I read over in my Bible in Psalm 130 and I heard God say, I picked you from the depths of your sin and became your salvation somebody. In Psalm 131 the Bible says that he calmed and quieted my soul. In Psalm 132 I read a little hymn and he said that he became the covenant of the world. In Psalm 133 I begin to read a little hymn and it said that God was our unity and became my anointing the Bible said over in Psalm 1 and 34 that he became my praise he became my worship and guess what I'm blessed because of it somebody give God praise in this house church we've got to keep climbing 
we've got to keep climbing your every promise is right here I don't know what you're going through I don't know what the devil's been trying to throw at you but I can guarantee this you can find it in Psalm 120 through Psalm 134 as God began to minister to me this week and he said it's about the ascent it's about where I'm taking them I'm raising up people who are like those who dream I'm raising up people who are those who are filled with laughter and shouts of joy rain forth from their lips amen I'm raising up a generation at RHC that the nations are going to speak about what you're doing not just Fairborn, Ohio not just this block but the nations shall write about what has been done at this church I wish somebody would give him praise in the house We're going to sing that same song that we sang as I took the pulpit today. And as you prepare yourself to come to this altar, there's a reason I had so many testimonies in our service today. Because God spoke to me about those who have been fighting the fight. And sometimes all we see is the struggle. But you don't know that that struggle is really the ascent. That struggle was them trying to get their foot up to that next rock so they can continue up that mountain. Can you go back to that clip? That struggle for the disciples was the fact that Jesus told them to go back to Jerusalem and wait for power from on high. But Jesus, it was in Jerusalem where they became hostile against you. And they began to speak against us. And just south of the temple in Jerusalem, they went to the upper room. They made their way up out of that valley and went into the city and began to worship. The ascent prepared them for that 10-day waiting period they went through before they received the power of God. And then they didn't know what was going to happen. They had never seen a manifestation of the Holy Spirit before. And what happened to them, they had no idea. Maybe, church, we need to erase in our minds what we know theologically. Maybe we need to just delete on the man-made doctrines for a Sunday. And maybe we need to be like those who dream. Maybe for a Sunday, we need to be like those who laugh with shouts of joy upon their tongue. Maybe for a Sunday, we just need to go get our mercy giver. Maybe just for a Sunday, we need to go back and get our restoration, our salvation. I want you to stand with me. And if you will, I want you to come to this altar. And I want to pray for as many of you as I can.